Hello everyone, um, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, before we begin, um, may I just check that everybody can hear my voice and that you can see the screen. If you could just type yes in the chat box, that would be great. Lovely, thank you so much. And thank you again for joining us today. My name is Natasha, I work in the ICE marketing team. I won't keep you too long. Um, I just want to remind everyone that today's webinar is being recorded. And this taster talk is um, part of an event series for the program that we are offering here, which is the MST in English Language Assessment. So today's talk will cover the role of technology in language, le in language learning and assessment. Um, the talk will be for about 20 to maybe 25 minutes um, and will be delivered by Dr. Jing Zhu. And um, this will then be followed by a Q&A uh, session as well. So if you have any questions about this subject area or the course offered at ICE, please feel free to use the Q&A box, which you can see in the toggle bar. We're also uh, joined by Zara today. So Zara is actually, she works here at the Institute and she will also be able to answer any questions you have around the MST in English Language Assessment as a programme and also the experience um, as a student at ICE as part of the University of Cambridge. So um, I think, um, that leads us quite nicely on to uh, introducing Zara and Jing. And thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, over to you, Zara. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello. And uh, yes, I'd like to add my welcome to you all um, to Natasha's. And I promise not to keep you too long because I know you're really eager to hear from Dr. Ding. Jing issue on the role of technology in language learning and assessment. I just wanted to give you a, a brief overview of who we are, a little bit about the MST in English language assessment, and then a brief introduction to Dr. Jing himself. So we are the University of Cambridge, uh, which is an 800 year old global institution with a history of innovation and leadership across a smorgasbord, if you like, of disciplines. And one of the missions of the university is to share its research with the world. Within the university, the Institute of Continuing Education um, was founded in around 1868 uh, by a gentleman called Dr. James Stewart. And James Stewart took a very practical approach to making the university's research accessible. He went across to working men's clubs and women's groups in sort of the industrial uh, Midlands and, and north of the UK and really shared the university's education with those who would not be able to attend otherwise. And years later, 150 years later, the Institute is still doing that. We design, deliver and curate a portfolio of short courses and award bearing undergraduate and postgraduate qualifications. And in addition, we are the admitting and awarding body for all MSTs, which is the Master of Studies and programmes across the university. And just to clarify, Master of Studies is a part time master's at the university. So why English language assessment? Well, I'm sure many of you here know, um, but there is an expanding need for English language assessment globally, and it's becoming ever more important to share best practice and, and the cutting edge research. And at Cambridge, we're in the hugely fortunate position to be at that cutting edge of research and, and have a vast amount of experience in the field. The MST itself is aimed at English language teachers and other educational practitioners and professionals seeking to enhance and consolidate their knowledge in English language assessment. And in common with our experience of all our courses at ICE and um, adult learning, um, it's a peer to peer is so important. And we anticipate a global cohort and they'll be sharing different perspectives and experiences and thereby gaining firsthand an understanding of the challenges of language assessment in different contexts and cultures. So I spoke a little bit about ICE um, and a bit about the course, but I'd really like to stress that this is a collaborative course. It's a partnership within the university between the Cambridge Language Sciences Interdisciplinary Research Centre, hereafter known as IRC, and um, Cambridge Assessment, specifically Cambridge Assessment English, which is a group within Cambridge Assessment. And there's also input from the Institute for Automated Language Teaching and Assessment, ALTA, and the whole course offers a unique combination of cross-disciplinary expertise. Um, just to go focus in a little bit on some of the partners, the IRC, 
as the name includes the word interdisciplinary. And the Cambridge Language Sciences is a virtual research centre at the University of Cambridge, set up in 2011 and based within the Department of Theoretical and Applied Linguistics. And its stated mission really is to bring together language researchers from different academic disciplines to develop new collaborations. And it should be added that MST students will become part of that research community straight away. They'll have a profile on the Language Sciences website on the course and be a really visible part of the research community. Interdisciplinarity is a sort of uh, a word that's going to keep coming back <laughs> with regard to Cambridge and this MST. It's going to offer excellent theoretical and empirical research in a broad spread of fields from historical linguistics and comparative syntax to language processing and computational linguistics and really support students to achieve excellence across a broad spectrum of linguistic research. It should also be noted that Cambridge routinely tops the National University League tables for linguistics. The staff of the MST will you know, include many researchers considered world experts. And our, um, our other partner, Cambridge Assessment, probably needs no introduction to the majority of you, but it's a world leader in assessment in educational contexts. And Cambridge Assessment English, which is within um, Cambridge Assessment, is a global leader in, is the, sorry, the global leader in English language assessment. And it provides exams in English for over 5 million candidates worldwide every year and as well as a leading range of qualifications for language teachers. Spoken about cutting edge, well, Cambridge Assessment uses cutting edge educational technology based on the use of digital data and devices for language education. Um, and it's anticipated that some of the teaching for the MST may be based at their global headquarters, the Triangle in Cambridge. So this all brings me rather neatly, well, hopefully neatly, onto my introduction um, to our speaker today, Dr. Jing Chu. He's a principal research manager in the research and thought leadership division of the Cambridge Assessment University of Cambridge. He received his um, PhD in applied linguistics and technology from Iowa State University, and he actually began his career as an English language teacher in China. So it's always a global perspective. Um, before joining Cambridge Assessment, he worked as a program assistant for the oral English certification test at Iowa State University, and was also a research intern at the educational testing service. And his current research, which I'm sure you're dying to hear about shortly, um, focuses on level two speaking assessment, automated scoring and feedback, computer assisted language learning and validity theory. Jing is a recipient of the Jacqueline A. Ross Dissertation Award presented by the Educational Testing Service and a co-recipient of the Best Article Award presented by the International Language Testing Association. And he's currently serving on the editorial board for the Language Assessment Quarterly Journal. And so, Without further ado, I'd really like to hand over to Dr. Jing Xu. Thank you ever so much. Thank you, Zara. It's my great pleasure to give this mini talk on the role of technology in language learning assessment. So my work is heavily involved in designing and validating technology enhanced language assessment and learning products. So I'd just like to share my thoughts with you about what is the current view on technology, technology use in language education. All right, so in this mini talk, I will cover three subtopics. Uh, I will talk about uh, the theorist view on the role of technology in language education. And then I will provide some examples of innovation technology connection uh, in, in the learning and assessment context, some products we have actually produced uh, to promote learning uh, in, in the educational context. And I will wrap up with some validity question of using technology. And because as researchers, we have to validate uh, the innovative use of technology uh, in learning products and assessment products. Okay, so, so this is a movie which was uh, shown back in 1989, which uh, is called Back to the Future, part two. Uh, it predicted the kind of the way people communicate like in, in the future, actually, uh, what we are experiencing right now uh, have been well predicted by this movie, uh, like a VR headset we wear, uh, the remote working, uh, via video conference technology, uh, is all has all become true uh, nowadays. Uh, and uh, indeed, technology mediated communication has become an essential part of our life. Like when you're writing an email, you use Grammarly to fix the typos. When reading on Kindle device, you look up a known word by simply clicking on the word. So the argument that uh, technology has become an integral component of language use and communication 
nowadays. Uh, this is a vision shared by Carol Chappelle, who is a leading expert in applied linguistics back in 2001. In her words, uh, she said, anyone concerned with second language teaching and learning in the 21st century needs to grasp the nature of the unique technology media tasks learners can engage in for language acquisition and how such tasks can be used for assessment. As of today, uh, language learners are living uh, in, in a world in which their communicative competence includes digital literacy. Uh, so digital literacy is kind of part of the language construct that we're assessing uh, in, in large scale tests and in learning products as well. Um, the reason why I want to introduce technology into the educational context is that the technology actually uh, is a game changer for revolutionize the way we, kind of, we teach and we learn. Um, this is a kind of a quote from Dorney and Skian, who actually are articulate the differences uh, between learners in terms of learning styles, or the aptitude in learning, like for example, from phonemic coding ability, grammatical sensitivity, and also learners are different in, in terms of their learning styles. Some are visual learners, some are auditory learners, and also learners have different motivations. Uh, some of the learners may be simply interested in the culture, the cu target culture behind the language. And some learners are more keen for career progression. And uh, in their words, Donnie and uh, Skian said, even though virtually all teachers would quickly agree that learners differ from one another, the bulk of the language teaching materials have assumed that all learners are the same. And this is something we cannot realize in traditional classroom setting. And we have to rely on technology uh, to change the scene. Um, in a book uh, written by uh, Neil Jones and Nick Savio, published in 2016, uh, about uh, learning oriented assessment, uh, a systematic approach, uh, the two authors mentioned that the, the role of technology in changing uh, the way we present learning and the teaching. In their words, they said, technology offers a ways to, of en engineering a transform transformative shift of emphasis in how learning is conceived and implemented. It offers an opportunity to break out of the box, which is a traditional classroom, and to create a wider ecological environment to support effective language learning. So what is the ecological environment, they define it as an ecosystem, ecosystem which integrates learning and assessment. And this is a visualization of the ecosystem, uh, which comprises, is comprised of different components, which include classroom teaching, uh, self-learning materials, learning apps for learners to practice language use, and exams, summative exams, formative assessment, and also collaborative opportunities to practice language use with, with partners, uh, with colleagues, and uh, with uh, other cohorts. Um, and also, most importantly, learners will receive feedback in this learning process. So this is uh, the core idea of the ecosystem is adaptive learning. So in which language learning activities uh, is a perceived process of produced language and receive further feedback. And in the same time, the language content uh, is constantly changing and the objective of learning is constantly changing based on your performance on these tasks. Um, and this all relies on technology because it's almost impossible for teachers uh, to tailor learning objectives for each individual students. Uh, it is through those constant assessment that we can build a learner profile and uh, we can uh, adapt the learning materials based on learners progress and their, but their strengths and weaknesses in, in different learning objectives. Um, so the role of technology in ecosystem are as follows, as pointed out by Johnson uh, Savio 2016. So the technology is able to deliver an immediate assessment of learning tasks. And also it's captured and recording learner performance data. And this data can be used to train an AI system which will select the proper learning tasks for learners. And technology can also track progress against certain goals and evaluate the learners' uh, weakness and strength, strength in different learning points, and thus creating individualized learning materials for each learner. Um, and also technology will provide uh, learners with different experience 
of languages like virtual reality, which we'll talk about later, uh, and also like uh, like di dialogue with the automatic automated system, um, which we'll show later, and also enable new forms of learning interaction. Um, and I think the important thing that uh, the technology would allow us to improve the process of learning. Uh, some technology we can use is eye tracking, so we can actually see how learners process information that is displayed on a screen. And eye tracking has also been used to validate a reading test in which learners actually focus on different parts of the test. And we can see what kind of skills are being elicited uh, by, by the test. So here are some examples uh, that we have uh, used the technology in assessment learning contexts. So this is a, let's see if I can play that. This is a, a virtual environment a virtual environment project that an intern uh, from the computer lab laboratory uh, created. Um, it is a virtual tour in Cambridge in which the learner is able to interact with the avatar. Uh, and the, the mission of this task is to book punting um, and to kind of negotiate the price, negotiate the time. Um, and this sort of uh, virtual learning environment provide learners with multimodal input and uh, allow learners to kind of complete a task uh, and to, um, to actually inter receive feedback from the avatar. Uh, we think that this is more motivational than traditional classroom teaching in which learners are not able to kind of, kind of immerse themselves in a real life environment. Uh, this is another uh, project which works on automatic content creation. Uh, you know, learners will be easily discouraged when they see materials which is beyond their level. So this is a project which is to train an AI system to simplify, simplify text based on learner's proficiency level. Um, so this research can automatically ad adapt the, the difficulty uh, of the text um, based on uh, some corpus. Um, for example, we have different collocations like a uh, uh, media rate situation, rectify situation, improve situation, or remedy situation. And based on learner's proficient level, the AI system will assess learner's ability and then adapt the language for the learner. So in this way, they won't encounter too many difficult words in reading. And this is in line with the reading improve project we are working on right now. So in this project, we provide learners with some placement assessment to check their level and then uh, provide them a text at the proper difficulty level. And based on their performance assessment, uh, the AI system will adapt the difficulty of the language uh, based on learners' needs, based on learners' uh, performance. Uh, this is another example about an AI system which can provide a diagnostic feedback for learning, for, for writing improvement. So this is a website called Cambridge English Writing Improved on which learners can um, practice writing on different topics and on different genres. So the AI sy system will provide a score based on the CFR uh, almost instantaneously and also provide feedback for learning with a focus on grammar, vocabulary, syntax. Um, at this point, uh, the AI system cannot comment on content, but actually it point out that the uh, the areas the writer can improve in, it's in highlighted words, uh, in different kind of symbols. Uh, it just shows you what are some areas you can improve. And you can submit the, this draft right again and to receive further feedback. And you will see the, um, the increase of your test results um, based on the quality of your, your vision. And similarly, we have developed uh, an automated scoring system um, for speaking improve. Uh, which is a um, speaking practice app, uh, which is a mobile app that you can, you can actually practice speaking and receive instantaneous feedback. So on the left, you can see the screenshot of the app. So that there's a, a robot which can interact with you um, and you will see the score right away uh, after you finish your, the speaking task. On the right side is something we are developing right now. It's a pronunciation feedback tool. Uh, when you speak to the computer, it will uh, run the 
recording through automated speech rec recognition. And uh, the ASR, automated speech recognition system, will tell you which words it is confident in recognizing. In other words, which words are intelligible which are not. So this sort of feedback is useful for help learners to improve their pronunciation. Um, now we are moving to the assessment context. Uh, this is computer adaptive testing, which we uh, uh, apply to lingual skill reading tests. So in this sort of test, uh, each candidate see different sets of items and then the difficulty of the items will change based on the performance on the previous item. And the, the advantage of the adaptive test is that it's usually shorter than linear testing, which the candidates have to see every single item. But in, a, in an adaptive test, uh, you will be given uh, items which are appropriate to your, uh, to your proficiency level. In other words, you are always seeing items, you'll be always seeing items that are not too difficult uh, not too easy. And this will increase the precision of te test results. And also this will avoid cheating because each candidate see different test items. Um, at the same time, the candidates will have more positive test taking experience because um, the test should not be too difficult for them. They're always seeing the items which are equivalent to their ability level. And this, picture shows you that you, you actually see, when you see more difficult items, when you, you get items right, and you see um, easier item when you got items wrong. Um, this is a video-based listening test. Uh, in the traditional English language assessment, um, only audio input is, is provided. Uh, and this is a researcher who actually uh, investigated the possibility of adding videos to a listening test. And then he explored the idea of having two different types of videos. One is context video, uh, which showed that uh, a lecturer is talking about, is giving a lecture, is talking about a topic. Uh, so there's no information provided in regards to, regarding the content of the talk. And on the right side is a lecturer, uh, lecturer who give a talk, but also uh, the, the content of the talk is actually visualized on the screen. Uh, he, he was seeing that which way is the more valid way uh, which was a method of uh, assessing listening ability. Uh, but you can see that uh, adding videos will increase the authenticity of the listening test. And also this is more uh, appropriate for assessing learners of lower abilities. Um, and it, during the pandemic, it's not easy to uh, schedule face-to-face -face oral exams. It's almost impossible, but uh, um, Back in 2017, a group of researchers uh, based in University of Bedfordshire and also collaborating with Cambridge Assessment, uh, they have started to explore the idea of remote speaking assessment in which uh, the examiner will um, kind of interact with the candidates uh, through a uh, through a video conferencing technology. Uh, the examiners will be actually showing the questions and some cues, some information on the screen to allow the candidates to understand the task. Um, in the meantime, the examiners will also uh, kind of enter in the, the test, the, the, their ratings onto the system. Um, and uh, in this research, no difference was found in test scores between, uh, between the two testing modes, um, but uh, it was found that some functions, uh, speech, speaking functions, uh, that is elicited by the test was different across different modes. So in the face-to-face -face mode, uh, there are more kind of functions of suggesting, suggestion and uh, elaboration, but uh, in, the, uh, in the remote mode, more clar clarification uh, functions were elicited. So this kind of cast a doubt on whether uh, the construct of speaking assessment has been changed due to the test delivery mode. Uh, finally, I'm going to talk about a, a, a new research which was published by uh, Educational Testing Service this year. So there are two, two researchers based in, based in Iowa State University develop a uh, interaction competence elicitor, which is essentially a spoken dialogue system. Uh, in, in traditional uh, computer-based assessment, uh, when there's a no examiner, uh, the, the tests usually elicit monologic speech. So 
the test gives you a question and you answer the question and that's it. There's no turn taking, there's no follow-up questions, which actually uh, is not able to assess the interactional competence uh, of the candidates, which is an important component of the speaking ability. So uh, the two researchers uh, kind of come up with this new thing, this new dialogue system, which is able to do the following things. Uh, the system will refute, it requires, relies on speech recognition. So it sort of transcribes learner speech into text and try to extract key information from the input. Um, based on this input, they will refute the test takers arguments against the matter of discussion, or they can present arguments in favor of the matter of discussion, or they can sometimes interrupt the test taker and uh, um, just to ask for clarifications. And they can also deliberately produce an intelligible speech to cause communication breakdown. Uh, so the candidates are expected to fix this, fix the, the breakdown, which is a part of the oral construct that we cannot assess in traditional computer-based speaking assessment. And then finally, um, the, the dialogue system can also change the topic and say like, oh, oh, I have enough understanding of this topic and let's move on to something else. So this is a very prototype product, which but it shed light on the future of speaking assessment. Uh, so in the future, we may need to rely on a dialogue system to moderate and speaking exam in a remote uh, kind of speaking mode. Um, Finally, gonna talk about some validity questions arising from using technology. Um, using new technology will likely to change many things. Uh, like it's not about only about a test delivery mode, it's about the skills that are being assessed and the way uh, learners process information. So these are questions that applied language, linguists are always interested in finding out. Um, for example, the validity question on automatic scoring the feedback. Um, these are the three questions that uh, she uh, from ETS posed back in 2010, but these three questions are still valid. Uh, the automated scoring yield scores that are accurate indicator of the quality of the test performance sample. So this is basically a question of uh, score reliability. So do auto marker yield the same score as human examiners do? And then the second question, do the automated scoring features under or misrepresent the construct of interest? So this is a, a question about construct, construct representation. So whether uh, the auto marker or the AI system assess the same features that a human examiner would, would, would evaluate in learner speech sample. If it's it, the AI system underrepresented the oral construct, then there will be a problem because some features that actually indicate learner's oral proficiency cannot be captured by the auto marker, then likely the auto index scores won't be unreliable. And finally, um, the question is on feedback. So the automated feedback leads to gains in target areas of language ability that are sustainable in, in the long term. So whether automated feedback is interpretable to learners, helpful for learners to improve their language ability is also a question that we want to investigate. It's concerned the impact of automated feedback on learning. And this is a set of questions on technology media test delivery. And we talk about computer adapted test. So in two different test modes, like paper, pencil, linear test, and computer adapted test, do the two testing modes uh, produce comparable test scores is a question that researchers are always interested in finding out. And the second question is, what do, to, to what extent do actual test takers watch context videos differently from content views in a video-based listening test? So this is about the cognitive processes during test taking. And this is also an important component in validity theory because we, we are not only interested in the test results, whether the test results can distinguish learners of different abilities, but also we care about how learners solve the problems. So this actually is relevant to the skills being assessed by the test, whether the, the test construct is relevant, cohere with the speech processing or listening processing theories. Um, and the third question is about remote speaking assessment. Uh, it's about the linguistic in output, which is elicited by two different speaking modes, face-to-face -face, uh, versus remote speaking, as I mentioned earlier. So the, the type of speech being elicited by the test will determine the construct of the speaking uh, of the test as well. Um, if we are only eliciting a certain, a certain number of 
function, language functions, then the speaking construct may be narrowed by technology use. And finally, the question is, do ratings, do ratings based on human or computer partner interaction result in more dependable test scores? So when rate, how readers perceive the interaction uh, between a human-human human interaction or human-computer interaction, would they actually, the two different interactional modes result in comparable scores is something we also care about. So the basic idea is that we have technology plays a crucial role in improving language education by providing potentially game-changing support. It just to totally change the context of learning and context of assessment. Um, and then we, the theorists perceive technology use as an integral component in kind of interweaving learning and assessment. But uh, as researchers, we also care about whether validity is still maintained by adding technology into the test design. So we need to ensure that the use of technology has a positive impact on language learning assessment, but the construct should, not man should be maintained the same and the construct should not be restricted by using technology. Um, and then that's the end of my talk and I hear the references. Um, I think these are, this is further information about this course. Um, I think, uh, I wonder whether Natasha or Zara want to pick up from here for Q&A. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the first questions come through. Um, is the MST online or remote learning based? Uh, no, so the expectation is that the MST will be studied uh, face to face. But just to clarify, because it's a part-time course, it's anticipated there'll be two um, two-week blocks across the two years uh, where the teaching will be delivered in residence in Cambridge. Um, and then throughout the course, you have access to our wonderful virtual learning environment and um, a kind of continued teaching experience online. Um, now, obviously, we're in the middle of a global pandemic and uh, the course begins in January. We can't say certain at this stage um, what the rules will be um, come the first residential. Um, but as part of the, as, as a master's at Cambridge, there is a residential requirement. So we would not be planning to um, teach it wholly online. Excellent. And just a reminder, if anyone has any questions for the speakers today, that please do use the, the Q&A tab and we'll try and answer as many as we can. Sort of building on that, um, are you aware of any short remote courses available for teachers from other nations? Um, Jing, you may be able to answer this on behalf of Cambridge Assessment. I mean, certainly we have our online courses at ICE in a variety of topics um, which are available to all, whether teachers from other nations or all or indeed any other profession. Um, and I think we can probably put the link to that in the chat. Um, but there may well be other specific courses at Cambridge Assessment. So Jean, please do jump in if so. Yeah, I think our team has expertise in different areas. So I, I mainly work on automated assessment and I think there are experts in eye tracking and experts in um, test validation and also, um, and also corpus linguistics. And so we have, expertise in different areas. I assume that uh, all of the research manager will, will be helping with teaching this ICE course yes. on different subject areas. Yeah, certainly within the course, it'll be, yeah, as you as said, it's a variety of um, expertise shared, um, but all within the kind of umbrella MST course. Thank you very much. Uh, next question is just around course fees and how much the course will cost. Yeah, so um, it's a two year course. Over the two years, if you're a home student, um, and you'd be able to check that using uh, university websites for international students um, or asking our admissions team um, on mst.admissions at ice.cam.ac.uk. Um, home fees are £10,000 across the whole year and international fees are £20,000 across the two years. Thank you very much. And the next question is around how often the programme will be offered. Will it be offered annually or every two years? Um, in the first instance, it will be offered every two years. Um, it, it's a flexible conversation, <laughs> so it may well be that we decide to offer it annually, but um, this is our first cohort and initially we're planning to open in January 2022 and then the next one will be sort of uh, 20, well, the academic year 23-24. Thank you very much. And uh, a question is wondering if we know who the tutors on the course will be yet. 
Um, so we don't have named individuals <laughs> for the course yet. We do have a course director um, who will hopefully be involved in our open day on the 2nd of June. Um, and there will be more information given about the teaching staff and, and a bit more information about the format there as well. But as, as mentioned, so um, as Jing mentioned, actually, it will be drawn from um, Cambridge Assessment English, various different parts of it, and um, the IRC, which was the Interdisciplinary Research Centre part of the Cambridge Language Sciences and some input from ALTA as well. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, a couple of comments here about participants wanting to receive a recording. So just a reminder that we are recording today's session uh, and we'll be emailing uh, a link to the recording um, in a short while. Uh, next question is, what kind of certificate will we get at the end? So the Master of Studies is a master's degree from the University of Cambridge. So. Um, you matriculate into the university, which means you are not only part of the university, but part of a college as well, um, and you study the two years, which includes a dissertation research um, project. And at the end of that, if you complete successfully, you get a degree, master's degree. The next question is, uh, do some research and study cases linked with what Cambridge Assessment does? <sighs> Jing, I'll let you yeah, I, I can pick up that question because we, we do a lot of research on um, our current projects, um, current product like IELTS, lingua skill. So I think I would anticipate that uh, the kind of course participants will have some hands-on experience helping validating, designing the assessment, like there's many products where we can actually share some hands-on tasks that to help doing data analysis um, and also uh, linking the uh, the learning to actually uh, the actually work we do within the research team. So there should be a close link between the two. Thank you very much. And the next question is around admission requirements for the program. So um, our standard admission for all MST courses uh, is having a 2-1 or equivalent, a 2-1 honours degree or equivalent in a relevant subject. Um, however, for our Master of Studies courses, we, we get a lot of people's experience in the field, and so we do encourage um, everyone to apply, um, uh, provided you have, have relevant experience in English language assessment. Um, and we would then look at your application based upon your professional experience as well as your academic expertise. Um, but if you go to our course page, which is up, up on the screen at the moment, um, you can not only apply, but there's further information about the um, entry requirements as well. Quite a few questions here, Zara, about language requirements as well. Um, and maybe if you talk to us a little bit about if someone has specific questions, who should they should get in touch with? Yeah, absolutely. So as I say, if you look at the course page, there's our standard language requirements. Um, the Our admissions team, um, the email for them is mst.admissions at ice.cam.ac.uk are the best people to ask for the most up-to-date uh, requirements on language. Um, as a general guide um, the university you know the university expects a certain language level and we improve of that language level that might be in the form of an IELTS test a TEFL test or if you've studied um, in an English-speaking country uh, recently at a degree level uh, for a certain number of years um, but I would I really would recommend getting in touch with our admissions team for that for the detail on that question. Thank you. And another question about the size of the cohort, how many students we expect to have? Yeah, so this is our first cohort um, and we're anticipating somewhere in the region of 20 to 25 students. Um, we are not at the moment anticipating taking more than that. If we get fantastic numbers of, of, you know, with huge numbers of really good applicants, we may look at it, but certainly at the moment we're anticipating 20 to 25 students. Another question around fees uh, and why the difference in price between home students and students abroad, as well as if you can maybe just clarify what we mean by uh, home students. Okay, so um, home students, again, this is one of the things that uh, I would advise looking at international students website on the, for the university, because this is something that's sort of set by the government and changes sometimes. <laughs> um, and I don't, you know, I don't want to give you the wrong advice. So have a look at it and um, it, it, you can, uh, there's a kind of calculator to work out your fee status. Um, it can relate to where you've been living uh, in permanent residence for the last, I think it's normally two years, um, as much as uh, your nationality. Um, the difference in price is fairly standard across um, our MST courses. Um, in, 
it, it relates to um, historically the subsidies given by the UK government for um, UK students, really, and then calculating the cost of the course against that. Thank you very much. Uh, next question is, you've estimated eight hours of study time per week. Uh, what kind of study task does this involve? Is this including working on assignments? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a range, a huge, huge range of study tasks. So within the residentials, there'll be sort of synchronous teaching sessions, obviously. Um, but um, and and during that period, it will be more than eight hours a week of study. Uh, but throughout the year, this may be additional reading, um, work on your research dissertation. It might be uh, the, you know, there may be things on our virtual learning environment. Um, it does really vary course by course, but it might be sort of blog posts or um, prompts given by some of the tutors to discuss. Um, and, um, and yeah, and then reading around the subject more generally and possibly tutorials. Thank you. And the next question, uh, is it possible to work with the supervisor and the ALTA project in this course? So when we come to um, determining supervised dissertations, what we do is we look very much at the topic proposed um, and then we find the best fit uh, for, for a supervisor. Um, ALTA will be inputting into the delivery. It hasn't been determined exactly how yet, and that may well be um, as a part of supervisions, but as it, it really comes down to the research topic and we want to make sure you get the best fits rather than saying it's from this place or this place. Thank you. Uh, next question is, I'd like to ask Dr. Jing, do you mind telling us the names of the two apps relating to automated scoring LT speaking and writing? Yeah, it's uh, Cambridge English uh, Writing Improve and Cambridge English Speaking Improve. You can Google them. And they are free, uh, free software program that you can use to improve your speaking and writing and that they are using AI technology developed by the Altai Institute. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, next question is, I have an MA in education. Can I join the course? Uh, and how about working experience if I work as a teacher freelancing? So um, MA in education could um, cover, a, it depends on where you've been working since, I would say. If you've got an MA in education and you are working in the fields of English language assessment, um, have an interest, uh, research interest in it, then absolutely an MA um, would be a, you know, you'd be a standard applicant um, from the academic point of view. Um, and then, you know, as you as you apply, please reference the professional experience you've had since. Um, and then you have an opportunity, there's a writing sample component as well to the application. Thank you, Zara. Uh, and a couple of questions just around when the deadline to apply for the 2021-2022 year. So it's August and I'm going to get the date wrong. I think it's 24th of August is the deadline <laughs> for the course. It's on the um, course page, so um, to confirm. And the next one is after earning uh, the MST, are you considered an alumni of yes. the University of Cambridge? Absolutely. It's a matriculated degree awarded by the University of Cambridge. You are an alumnus, alumna, 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 alum of the University of Cambridge and, um, and also of a college that you matriculated into. Thank you, Zara. And the next question, uh, living and teaching full-time uh, outside of the UK, would I be able to continue working and attend classes online and just go to Cambridge for the two face-to-face -face teaching weeks? Yes, it's a short answer. Um, provided you come to the um, residential components of the course, which as I said, I think are planned to be two lots of two week um, teaching periods, then yes, you can, you can study the rest of the course from wherever you are living. You were close, Sarah. The application deadline is the 23rd of August. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> time, time difference. It, it, could, it could make a bit of difference. But yes, apologies, 23rd of August. <laughs> and a, a question here that's maybe uh, specific to the individual, but I'll ask anyways, just so we can re reiterate where these questions can be directed to. Um, yeah. I've worked in Singapore, which is an English speaking country. Do I still need to submit an English language certificate? So there are different routes of um, English language certificates. Um, there are some, some countries are, um, they, they classify them as list A countries, that's like the UK and like USA, um, where you wouldn't necessarily need to submit a language certificate. There are other countries where English is predominantly spoken, um, which are classified as list B country. And I would really advise checking with admissions whether Singapore is list A or list B. Um, and um, you would 
if, if you're in a speak country, it may be that you take a, a language centre test, so at our university language centre, rather than submitting an IELTS or TEFL test. Um, again, there are different variables, so I cannot stress this enough in terms of education. Um, and you know where you studied and whether you studied in English and how long ago and how long for. So please do check um, with the um, admissions. And you know, sometimes I'm really aware that with the language requirement, occasionally it seems unfair, and it's just it's a central university requirement. And so, it's, we we really do try and take into account individual circumstances. But ultimately, we have a, it's a sort of decision tree um, as to whether we need a, a certificate or not. Next question is around, uh, is there a graduation ceremony at the end of the program? Uh, yes, I can see this question as well. And there's another bit about whether we're real graduates from Cambridge. So yes, um, again, as, as an MST student, an MST is a master's degree from Cambridge. It's studied part time, which is why it's called Master of Studies rather than Master of Arts or Master of Philosophy. But it, it is, in, for all intents and purposes, the same as a master's degree. Um, and you, as you're matriculated into a college, you would have a graduation ceremony associated with that college. Um, depending on the timings and um, our efficiency in getting certificates printed, you would receive a certificate at that point. You certainly have a transcript um, by the time you had a graduation ceremony and you would receive a certificate from the University of Cambridge. The next question, uh, Cambridge assessment run a postgraduate advanced certificate in educational assessment. Uh, do you know how that course compares with this master of studies? Jing, I'm not sure if you're aware of, aware of this one, if you want to ask. Um, actually, I'm not aware of this, uh, but I think that's a certificate. This is a master's degree, right? So that's yes. a difference. And also, I think that this master's program focuses on English language assessment, uh, which is a narrower area than educational assessment in general. So language assessment is different from educational assessment, although they, there's a common area in terms of measurements and statistics, construct okay. theory, etc. And I agree and, and point out as well that the MST, is, as I said, is a collaboration uh, within the university between um, the IRC um, with a focus on theoretical and applied in the Department of Theoretical and Applied Linguistics as well. So that which ties into, um, as Jing said, the focus on, on language assessment. Um, and, and yes, the postgraduate certificate is not, uh, not normally a matriculated. Um, it's, it's not a two year master's, essentially, it's a slight, it's, it's not quite the same level. In terms of research dissertation. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, next question. Uh, does the tech module in this program require some prerequisite knowledge in computer science? Engineering. Um, <laughs> yeah, not really. Actually, um, the L times, if you are a student from computer laboratory or from engineering, so then you will be required to design and you know code, code, coding skill. You have need to have coding skill, but this is a more like applied linguistics area. So you will be uh, you will be learning how to validate the use of technology in learning assessment products. But you will know some basic coding skills for sure, especially for data analysis. Thank you. Uh, next question is, does the cost of the course include all of the costs of the two week residential course, yeah. except for travel, obviously? Uh, no, so it includes all the teaching um, for the two-week residential course, along with all the teaching for the MST. Um, during the two-week residential, you will be, it was anticipated you'll stay in college, um, and you normally pay, you would pay a student rate for your, your, your accommodation in the college. Um, so there's the travel, there's travel costs plus the accommodation costs in addition to the course fee. Thank you. Uh, next, there's a couple of questions around um, scholarships and bursaries. Uh, and if there is any specific related to international students? Um, there are some scholarships available um, through the Central University. There's none, as far as I'm aware, specifically at this point, available for this course, um, whether for international or for home students. Um, again, Jing, if you're aware of any that relate to Cambridge Assessment, um, please let us know. Um, I'm not aware of any scholarship related to this particular program. No. <laughs> Uh, sort of a related question around, uh, I guess, paying of fees. Uh, does the course offer concessions or discounts for CAM card holders, so University of Cambridge alumni? Uh, so uh, I would I would recommend checking our bursaries page for this and the last question, actually, on our website, which is if you go to www.ice.cam.ac.uk and, and with bursaries, um, 
far as I'm aware, uh, there are no discounts or bursaries for CAM card holders on MST degrees because they're matriculated and you have the college um, portion as well. We have quite a few um, questions coming in with very specific questions about individual language requirements and whatnot. So just to reiterate, uh, if you do have any specific questions related to your own situation around language ability, uh, to please, please do get in touch with our admissions team. Um, they'll be able to give you the most uh, up-to-date and personalized answer um, with regard to your own situation. Yeah, and I would recommend getting in touch with them when you're, you know, as you're going through the application process as well. Uh, so the way the process works is um, you, you apply, you submit an application, um, and then um, the applications are shortlisted for interview. Um, and after interview, we make recommendations of offer. Um, they get approved through um, various degree committees and things. Um, at that point, if you then receive a conditional offer, one of the conditions may be a language, a language test or proof of language. Um, if you leave it until that point to find out whether you need to or not, then you, you, the window is, is slightly shorter in terms of if you do need to then take a test, actually booking a test. Um, so if you, if you do a bit of investigation now, um, it, it can be quite helpful. I would say. Next question. Um, are students required to be teaching at the time that they are taking the course? I'm quite concerned that research work involves student performance observation and assessment, etc. Certainly from uh, where we put the course together, there's no specific requirement to be teaching because we're, it's, it's, it's aimed at it's educational professionals, but also other professionals who are involved in English language assessment. Um, so no, um, there's not. I mean, in, depending on your research topic, it may, it may well be advantageous, but it, that, that really comes down to the research topic you choose. Uh, next question. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Uh, is this representative of the kind of ideas that will be covered in the course? Uh, actually, the, the course content will be more will be broader. Uh, this yeah. is a very specific area uh, regarding the use of technology in assessment learning. So this is my concentration area. So you, if you want to do a dissertation with me, then <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy exactly. to hear that's interesting. <laughs> oh, it's fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and we have a question too around if there's any recommended reading uh, that participants could do before starting the course. Um, so we will be um, putting on the website probably around July time, um, a more detailed course guide, and that will probably include some recommended reading as well. Thank you. Uh, next question. Um, some of the major problems I have experienced seems to be with lack of sufficient training or access to these apps for teachers. Is there, are there any plans to incorporate teachers into free access to these apps, which I think you, you mentioned before? Um, some of the apps are already free. Um, there, there are pro, um, paid version, which is unlock some, uh, some certain genres, some certain topics. But I think uh, it, it's free access for 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 taste experience. Uh, I believe if you enroll in the program, that we may have we can create kind of tokens for you to access some of the apps that we develop. Because if you want you to put your hands on those projects um, to let you experience developing and validating these products, or you may need to give you free access to these products uh, within the two year period, I think. Excellent, that appears to be uh, all of the open questions. I think we could, we could possibly end there. Thank you very much uh, to both of our speakers today for their, their time and uh, information related to the subject and to the program. Uh, thank you everyone for your, your questions as well and hope you have a, a great rest of your day. Thank you all. Thank you, Corey, thank you. for moderating the Q&A. <laughs>